so I think this course is a great idea, and I'm just glad to be a uh, part of it. At last, I wasn't able to participate early because it's the exact same time as I'm teaching my artificial intelligence course um, every Tuesday and, and Thursday. So, so that's all over now, and uh, this is my chance to say something to you folks. So uh, I, want, I want to talk about the singularity, talk about prospects for digital immortality. Now, I figure you guys have already covered a lot about the singularity. And um, so we will, we will be able to, well, I'll have to sample you a little bit about that. Um, uh, so here's, here's what I think is the best definition of the technological or AI singularity. This is from Werner Vinge. It seems plausible that with technology, we can, in the fairly near future, create or become creatures who surpass humans in every intellectual and creative dimension. OK, now, is that all familiar to you guys? Familiar? Familiar? Yeah, OK, so that's the, that's the idea. I like to, in my own words, I say it's when the smartest thing on the planet is designed rather than evolved. And that's, that, I think, is the key. It's, it's that it's a design thing that was created in, in something's head before it existed rather than evolve naturally through biology. So in the light of the singularity, I'm going to focus on uh, a few questions today. Um, what is the AI singularity? And I, I say it as AI singularity, just to be a little bit more specific. There are many aspects to technology. Um, this is the one having to do with when we make intelligent systems and then we get the positive feedback that that involves. So maybe I've given you a quick definition, and we're going to uh, briefly cover, I, 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 I may, so the, the natural thing I thought it might cover is will it occur and when will it occur? And have you guys been through all that? Like, do you have like a time frame for when the singularity is supposed to happen in your heads? Yeah, you do? So would you say, uh, will, it, will it ever occur? Yeah, tell me, will it ever occur? If we had 200 years, what? How many thinks it will occur? <laughs> Not too many. Cool. OK, so let's, let's, let's do that. Um, will it occur? And so as always, you know, the strategy of looking at these hard, big questions, you've got to uh, break things down. Um, well, first you make definitions. So I've sort of defined what I mean by it. Uh, and now we'll break it down. Uh, first, is it at all possible? And I'm thinking that if, machine, if people we can think of as biological machines, um, then eventually we'll be able to reverse engineer them. And then we will understand how they work. And if we can understand how they work, then surely we can make improvements using the technology that we do know. This is a very um, uh, simple argument that I think we can all understand without any uh, fancy technical aspects. But you know, we'd have uh, materials that are different technology that's different than what is used by biology, and in some ways it's superior, and we ought to be able to take advantage of, of those. And so we find something we can improve. Uh, you know, just the whole fact of engineering and design, you can consider many possibilities and, and work them out, whereas biology has to like be very conservative and just try things that are consistent with what's already done. So I think that if, if, it, if it's useful to think of people as biological machines, and you guys are at least um, you know, biologically oriented is a, in the sort of a medical course, related course. And uh, so you should be uh, maybe used to thinking of uh, biology as, as, a, as machi machinery. The heart is our pump, the muscles are our motors, we have sc our cameras are our eyes. And, uh, and if you think about all these ligaments and stuff, it's just like pulleys and, and ropes. Um, there, and, and when you go down to the cellular level, of course, biology is also very machine-like, uh, or can be viewed as machine-like. So I think we're going to be able to reverse engineer it, and then we ought to be able to do it better. And uh, that's just whether it can be done. Second is, you know, will it be done? Well, some of you may just right away say, well, if something can be done, then it will be done. Everything that can be done will be done if you wait long enough. And uh, I think there's some truth to that. But of course, there are some ways it cannot succeed. What if we just destroy ourselves first, nuclear war, 
or some other disaster, environmental disaster, uh, it's not a certainty that we will have the singularity can be done. But if that, nothing terrible like that happens, we should realize there's going to always be strong pressures, incremental economic pressures to make more and more intelligent systems. Uh, if you make the, the phone that can do speech recognition, there'll be, you can make a lot of money out of that. If you make the, phone, the next phone that will, I don't know, know your name and be able to recognize your face, you'll make a lot of money off of that. So it seems there will always be incentives that will lead inexorably towards smarter and smarter systems, and thus the AI singularity. Um, and so at the same time, it's unlikely that these forces could be resisted. Um, if you don't want to make money on it, someone else will want to make money on it. If some nation tries to forbid uh, our AI technology, then some other nation will do it. Um, I don't think it can be controlled. There's just too much value to doing it and too many independent actors. So I think it will occur. In fact, uh, I'm going to tell you my own way of thinking about it, which is maybe a bit extreme, but, but it's good to have different ways of thinking about things. And here's, here's one more way of thinking about things. Um, thinking of the big picture, that this thing, the technology, the technological singularity is like the fourth age of the universe. And I mean the big ages. So these are my four big ages. You know, there was a time after the Big Bang when there were nothing but particles, not even dust, because there wasn't any molecules. Okay? And, and the world was that way for a while. And then it changed. The particles coalesced into stars. Uh, the stars burnt. And eventually, they went supernova. Because in the age of stars, there was, in the original age of stars, there was only uh, what, uh, like hydrogen and helium. And it's only through supernovas that the more, the heavier elements were produced. And so the age of stars then ends or it ends locally in the formation of, of planets. And soon after that, we get the origin of life and replicators. So this is what I think is the third age, when you have systems that could reproduce themselves. Um, and then, inevitably, perhaps, they will develop technology as part of the competitive struggle for survival and culture and language and, and technology. So technology, uh, and then what is the, the, I'm calling it the age of design because these are things that were conceived in the, the mind of some, some animal and then, and then created. And that's, what, that's the difference between design and undesigned things. It's a question of the essence existing before the thing existing. Um, so, so the view here is that it's almost an inevitable process of the evolution maturing, is to make technology and then uh, singularity and transcendence. And what happens after that, uh, I guess we don't know. But we'll think about it a little bit. So. If that's a view that it will occur, then the next question is, when will it occur? Will it occur in our lifetimes? And there are many uh, slides of the exponential progress in technology. This is, this is one of the most famous ones developed by Hans Moravec, who's an AI researcher. And uh, this one actually tries to plot out when the growth of, of computer power, growth of computer power per dollar, actually this is computer power for $1,000. And we, we see that this has grown steadily, perhaps even faster than exponentially, for a very long time, at least 60 years. 60 years doubling every 24 to 18 months. Um, this, is, this is really an amazing fact about the world. And as far as we can tell, there's no real reason to expect that to change, at least for many more doublings, um, at least for a few decades, two or three decades. And so by that time, uh, well, the other thing that Hans Moravec did is he tried to estimate how much computer you needed, computational power you needed to make a human brain, or how much computation is done by the human brain. Actually, as you see on the right-hand side, it's all laid out for different animals, an estimate of how much computation they've used. Um, and these, these, these are only rough estimates, but they're, they're actually fairly well informed. Uh, Hans studies computer vision, and he he, he studied the retina very carefully, and he made estimates of how much computation the retina can do, um, and then s extrapolates that out to the mass of the brain. 
and, and so this estimates, if you follow those lines out, and uh, we're probably at least on the middle green line, if not the, the highest green line, which will get us to roughly the level of human level computation uh, by 2030. And uh, many people's estimates who've looked at it carefully uh, end up with that kind of number for when we would have the computer power of the brain. Uh, people get longer ones if they just want to be conservative, but if you do the math and look at the trends, this is what you would get. This is what Ray Kurzweil gets. This is what um, David Waltz got as far back as 1988. Um, so he says, he's another AI researcher, we are nearing an important milestone in the history of life on Earth, the point at which we can construct machines with the potential for exhibiting an intelligence comparable to ours. Okay, so the cautions in those words, it says we can construct machines with the potential, not that we will. Uh, and the problem is that we don't have the software, we don't have the algorithms to run on those machines. We'll have the computer power, it seems fairly plain, but we don't know if we will have the so software and the algorithms, as we because we don't now. Um, but of course, the existence of the hardware will tremendous spur if the only thing that's holding back uh, important economically important applications is uh, the algorithms. Then there'll be great power to make those algorithms. Okay. So this is sort of the introduction, and now we can get to uh, how to think about where we are now. Uh, so guys like me doing artificial intelligence research, um, this is the implications for us. Computation gets cheaper and cheaper. And in the long run, this means that using computation, using data, is the way to win. It's the way to get faster, better AI systems, and not the sort of traditional AI strategy of putting more and more human knowledge in. So and we can see this. And actually, it rules throughout all the sciences the engineering, I would say even through arts, is that computation is the big deal. Uh, if you look at, at biology, it's genome sequencing, it's protein uh, simulation. If you look at physics, you're simulating complex physical systems. If you look at the internet, uh, if you look at machine learning, the statistics and uh, data are what's so important in them nowadays. Uh, in, in many kinds of, of art, performance art, we get more and more use of computers and, and uh, in even creating uh, music and images. So this, this is where the world is heading at all the levels, and particularly in AI, it means the methods that are based on massive computation will become more and more important. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Well, we can help make artificial intelligence. We can try to profit from them. We can try to become them. Uh, but we probably cannot prevent them or control them. Um, there, it's hard to control something that's smarter than you, and it's probably not wise. Uh, so we're left, we're having to ride the storm of the singularity. Now, specifically about digital immortality, the question is, can we make people that are digital? Now, there's two, two things that question might mean is, can we make new people? Can we create AIs? And I, th I think that's, we can certainly do that to some extent already. But, uh, and we will certainly do more of that in the future. And once we have, it will be easy for them to be digital, right? They will be digital, and because of that, we'll, they'll be able to be copied and have backups, and it will just not be a problem. Um, uh, the real question is what we do with existing people. If you're, uh, would you, is it possible to digitize ourselves? And the reason we want to digitize is because it's, it's, it's the key to longevity. If you have things that can only be in some clear states, digit, digital states, then they can last forever, just the way your memory can last for a long time. And, and it enables uh, things to be backed up. So what exactly do I mean by this digitization? Uh, okay, mental, I'm talking about digitizing a mind. So the transfer of the essence of a biological person's mind to a new physical substrate. Let's call it a brain. Uh, it could be a, a computational brain. It's a brain that's digital. And all of its state can be recorded and reproduced at a later time without significant loss. Okay, that's, that's the idea. Um, and 
I think we would normally think that this might be nice, but we don't know, I may not be sure if it's at all possible, or even if it's nonsense to talk about um, transfer of a mind to a hardware, digital hardware. Um, and we also might ask, you know, do we have standing to ask these questions? Or is it appropriate that we should do it, or should we lose it, leave it to philosophers or, or people that know more than we do um, about something? And I don't think we should. I think we have standing. Uh, we all are experts in one thing or another and, and not experts in many other things. I've, I feel I have some standing because I've done AI research for 30 or more years, and I also have a, studied psychology. Um, and uh, I think we have standing because it matters. We're going to live through what happens, I think, according to my, uh, the projections that I've suggested. And so it should matter to us, and so we should we better think about it. You can also ask, is this at all a medical issue? And I think it absolutely is. It's almost the ultimate medical issue. Um, how can you preserve the life and function of a person despite the failure of their physical substrate? Uh, it's absolutely, so if you have a doc, if you're a doctor uh, and you had this available, if this was possible, you would never deny it to a patient who needed it. Uh, so can we offer the digital cure? Is it possible? Uh, would you want it if it was offered to you? Uh, and I don't know if everyone would say it, probably not everyone, maybe not even most people, but many people would want it. So let's ask if there are any uh, major stumbling blocks. Can we, can we, is this, is this nonsense? Um, so the first thing you might think is that, well, you know, our, my mind is in my physical body, and there's no way I can transfer that to a computer. But if you think about it just a moment longer, it's not, it's not true. You, you're not really tied to your physical substrate at all. The atoms in your body are not the same atoms in your body 10 years ago. Um, they have passed through you. Even many of the cells have been replaced. Uh, the digital part, the DNA, uh, is retained. But that's not the atoms. Uh, and it's, the, it's the, the logic, not the physical aspect to it. The digital part is retained. So uh, the bottom line is that we are not our atoms. We are the pattern in our atoms. Um, you might think uh, one analogy that sometimes uses that to a river, a river flowing down the stream, and there's an eddy behind a rock, and that eddy stays there. Right? You can watch it for hours. That eddy maybe changes a little bit, but this, the eddy remains. The, the water molecules passing down the river are totally changing. We are like the eddy in the stream. We're not the water. And we need to retain the eddy. We don't need to retain the water. And uh, so, so we're really talking about reproducing this pattern of our, of our behavior, pattern of our thinking uh, inside the, the, the computer, the machine. OK, so the next question is, if we're patterns, is it an essential that the pattern be reproduced exactly? Because we can't expect it to be. I don't expect it to be. We'll get some approximation. Um, but uh, we won't get an exact copy. I don't think that should concern us either. You know, the pattern that we have now, it's not the same as it was 10 years ago or when we were a child. It's essential, really, to life that we change, we grow, and we, uh, and we are informed by our experience. And we're not exactly the same. We, we, in many cases, we're proud that we, of the person we are, we've worked hard to become. So we don't really need to be exactly the same. Um, so I, uh, somewhat facetiously, uh, identity, personal identity is more like horseshoes. <laughs> close, being close is good enough. Uh, so we don't have to let that dissuade us. Um, now let's think a bit what digital life uh, would be like. And the point is, it's, it won't be like regular life. It won't be as linear. Um, we can make backups. If you are a digital being, and you can, that means you can record and, and reproduce your pattern. Maybe you're loaded into uh, a robot, and that your, your state can be read out and stored. And if the robot uh, dies while hang gliding or whatever, you can get a new robot and and load yourself back 
into the new robot with, with no damage at all, because it's digital. Okay. And similarly, we can make copies. You can, if you have two spare robot bodies, you can load yourself into both, and they can go learn different stuff and then maybe get together again and merge back into one at some point. Or, or just keep proceeding independently. So one implication of this, uh, there are many implications to having a digital uh, a mind. Um, uh, and some of them reverse the usual ways of thinking. So we're used to thinking that life is so precious. And you know, the mind is so precious. And the, it's, you know, the body is sort of expendable. Like, OK, if, if I uh, lose my uh, part of my body, if it can be replaced, uh, I'm, I'm happy, you know? So, so as I just said to you, we could do hang gliding, and if we, if we die, we can be, load our mind into a, a new body. So that's sort of saying the mind is the valuable part and the body part is sort of expendable. But if you can really have digital life, it may switch around because um, the more bodies you have, the more you can multiply yourself. And, uh, the only reason you won't make more copies is you don't have enough bodies. So if you have two bodies available, you may load them up with copies of yourself. They can learn something. Uh, then you might kill one of them because you need to use his body for another copy of yourself. Uh, so kill, you kill off this, this independent thread of a mind uh, because you need its body for use by another thread of your mind or another copy of your mind. Um, it may switch around body may become more precious than mind because mind is now cheap and it's not really at, at danger of being lost at all because you have a backup uh, somewhere and it's the minds that are the key the bodies that become the key resources um, now of course if you're digital you can also just turn yourself off and and let the world run without you for you know a few thousand years and thus you can travel forward in time uh, you could also experiment with yourself you could if you can alter your, a copy of yourself or alter a version of yourself, you can try different ways of being and, and be rest assured that you can always be brought back to where you were. Nevertheless, there are lots of dangers to this designing yourself and altering yourself. Uh, you, you, well, there are good things, right? You may obviously add, your, add new sensors to yourself or new motor abilities. Uh, you may also mental abilities. You might make yourself have a better memory, you might may be better able to focus on a problem, access to the internet. Um, and these are all kind of good things, but they also uh, may lead you to drift away from the person you originally were. Uh, for example, you might want to change your goals, make yourself less easily distracted by unimportant things. Um, in these cases, all these cases, you, you lose, well, you, you change and you have the potential for losing contact with your original self which may be good, may be not so good. If you change your goals and just pursue off something unrelated, you may not want that to happen. Or you have the issue of you're splitting into multiple copies, and then uh, you know, they, may, they may not like each other. They may not like each other, uh, or may not want to re rejoin again. So in summary, um, I think the prospects for digital immortality are good. And in this sense, there's no clear reason why digitization of existing people should be nonsense, should not make sense, should be impossible. And at the same time, it would be very desirably, medically and personally, for in many, many cases. And the confusing part is not so much even the digitization, but what happens afterwards. Do you want to worry about backups and copies, splitting and merging? That's what happens afterwards. Uh, and these, all those sort of things may end up that we don't care about immortality. I mean, even, even the idea of immortality is about I. I will live forever. But if you are splitting into copies, changing, merging in different ways, the notion of I uh, doesn't have as compelling a meaning as, as it has for us now. So, so I think it's something that that's, that's, we, we, we should take seriously, uh, digitization, of minds, and that that might be an important part of the future, and the medical future in particular. Um, so those are the things that I've talked about today. Uh, what is the singularity? 
it's likelihood of occurring. I think it will occur. And I think it will occur in our lifetimes if, we're, uh, if we remain healthy. And uh, it has many, many implications for us. And that uh, it's a good possibility we can, make, we can make existing biological beings digital and then uh, live forever in a particular kind of way. Thank you very much. Well, now I can't walk around. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. Great. Thank you, Rich. So that was all very compelling. Um, so a question about what happens, I guess, in the near term. So there's sort of two related questions. And it's really about whether our current approach to computing in, in silicon and the way we, we do our computation is actually a, a viable substrate. So you talked about the, the eddy. We need to capture the pattern. So is our current computing system, our architecture, our silicon chips, is that capable of capturing the kind of eddies we want? And in a, in a related note, and if the power goes out, we lose our eddies. So is our current substrate what we need to move forward, or should we be looking at other substrates for computation to allow what some of the ideas that you put forward? I guess I do feel it's enough to move forward, because we don't have uh, the answers yet. We don't know how to make them yet. So, it's, so the fact that, that the hardware is not what would be most convenient for living digitally is, is not holding us back. Uh, but you're right, in the long run, we, would, uh, we need to deal with that. Um, one of the biggest parts of it, of course, is interfacing to the nervous system, which is something I know you've, you've, you've worked on. And, uh, and that relates to like intelligence augmentation, which is almost the other way to be, uh, become digital. You could, I mean, what would it be like yeah, well, to, to become digital? Would you like just keep adding on more and more digital parts to your brain? It gets, it's larger, and now a larger percentage of you are, are digital, but there's still a biological core. Uh, it might work that way. And then if the biological core fails at some point, then you might not even notice tremendously if it's been copied well. Or, or it could be you construct it outside. Here's the robot. You tune him up to behave more and more like you do, have the same sense of humor, the same similar goals. And then one day you decide, oh, yeah, that's close enough, and you turn yourself off. Uh, it's, it could be that. I, it really, I, 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 that's a little bit facetious, but really it could be you make it more and more like you and then you would die naturally, which is much the same effect. Uh, it's funny the sense, like, you know, we go to bed every night, we wake up in the morning, we consider ourselves to be the same person, but we're not. Uh, and there are many science fiction stories of people, of, of cases where you transfer to another body and they always make it so that they they close down the old one before they start the new one. Uh, but isn't that sort of unnecessary? Um, if you really had the guarantee that you're creating the new one, you wouldn't really need to preserve yourself. And think about it. If you can make a copy, um, and you, you could say, oh, still I need the old one, and I don't want to die. I'm the old one, and I don't want to die. Or you could say, oh, I'm perfectly fine. That new one is, is me, I'm good with that, you can kill me. Now, um, which one of those is, is right is sort of, sort of deep philosophical question. But we can answer some things clearly. If you have an organism that's perfectly happy uh, transporting itself by making a copy remotely and allowing itself to be killed, and because of that it gets even a small advantage, like it gets paid a dollar. Now, the organism that's, that's good with doing that, doesn't care about being killed, will be more successful. It will get lots of lots of, of dollars. So there's maybe, you know, I, I think to me that suggests that maybe we shouldn't care so much. If we can make a good deal that I will be made a copy, then you can kill me, it should be fine. Uh, it'll be just like waking up. To, to, it'll be the same as much as waking up the next morning is. So uh, how much uh, elitism and uh, uh, ideas that only work for rich people in uh, California versus the whole world are, are we looking at here? Is, is it, uh, when, when, when you say that these things are possible, do you mean they're possible for the whole world? Or are they possible in uh, Central Africa? 
or are, are they just possible in parts of the uh, developed world? Do you see the singularity as being a simultaneous worldwide phenomenon, or just little pockets here and there, and then it takes decades for it to play out in the same way for everybody else? Well, thank you, Kim, for drawing attention to the unasked question. <laughs> it's still up there. Uh, is it a good thing, this thing that's going to happen? Uh, I'm sort of deliberately uh, leaving it off because it's, maybe because it's controversial or, or maybe because so many, we have so many different views of what is good to happen. Um, and so, but I mean, the question of whether it's good is totally independent of, or almost totally independent of whether, whether it's going to happen. And so I've tried to focus on what will happen. And then we can ask about, you know, will it be good, who it will be good for, you can point to all the past examples of technology that starts with the elites and then becomes inexpensive and helps the whole world. And I guess I do find that pretty compelling. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, it, it will, uh, I don't know what will happen exactly. It'll start with the elites. And maybe we can hope that like cell phones, it'll get to Africa Right. Pretty quick. And then what about species? Should this be human specific if, if we find that we're able to upload a animals, make them as smart as we are? Do we have a moral obligation to do that? And will there be a you know, singularity amongst primates and whales and gray parrots? And, or... or, or uh, does an AI researcher, by definition, stay pretty much focused on, on the human side of things? We are all riding the storm, <laughs> and none of us can control it. Um, I would like to, you know, I could tell you what I'd like to see happen. What good would that do anybody? Uh, I could try to guess what will happen. Yeah. Uh, We're, we're at an interesting time. It's 48 yeah. hours since four chimpanzees were proposed as being uh, 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 represented as persons have, having rights of persons. Do you think, is, is this an important lawsuit that's been filed? Is it trivial? Does it change things in, in your own thinking about the world when, when you think about you know, uh, I think our usual notions of those things, are they right deserving persons? Those are all gonna be radically changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I make 100 copies of myself and they all apply to vote, you know? Right. Uh, I think, uh, so once you can make copies, once you can digitize AIs, once AIs exist, uh, so much of our normal intuitions uh, get challenged. Um, you know, we're so used to thinking, you know, there's only one me, mm -hmm. and I am the same person. And, and it's just sort of a coincidence of our normal lives that we have one body, one person, and if you're damaged, uh, you, you can't right. recover from that. I mean, that's, that's the way the world has been for as long as there's been mankind, as long as there's been animals. And if, uh, that doesn't, I don't think that's going to be preserved. Yeah. If, if you're trying to distill down to its essence the reason why the singularity is uh, dysphoric, it is because we believe that uh, machines will always be rigid. They'll be literal thinkers that, you know, if we program them, they'll make mistakes because of the literalness. But doesn't machine learning itself mean exactly the opposite of that, that you end up with a machine black box that, that successfully solved the problem in a way that you cannot express in words? And if that's true, then why should machines have any more literalness problem than human beings do? We may have a bigger literalist uh, uh, problem 
in that we want everything expressed in words. You know, machines don't require that at all. So looked upon that way, if machines are as flexible as human beings, then maybe this is not a, a dysphoric idea at all. Maybe uh, morality in the hands of uh, machines and uh, big decisions about the world will actually be conducted better than they would be by uh, human beings. I think the sense uh, of dysphoria is, is not so much because of the literalness as it is uh, a loss of control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we should feel loss of control anyway because uh, the world is being passed to our regular children and our regular children may have different ideas than us. Yeah, but it, it's, it's not just a generational thing. I mean, we're all relatively powerless in the world right now but we trust, to some extent, some limited ex extent, the, the, the people who have leadership power. Couldn't we trust leadership machines if we had been given the evidence that, that they're doing a pretty good job as, as well as we would trust a, a politician or bureaucrat now? <laughs> Maybe more. Of course, yes. <laughs> I, I would agree, but it's not because the machines would necessarily be doing a trustworthy job, but more because the politicians are not doing a trustworthy <laughs> job already. I um, see. I don't think I, I should do I think all. It's crazy. I, I probably should tell you, Rich, that I'm the resident dissenter in this uh, outfit. Um, one of the things that, uh, well, first of all, this is artificial intelligence. And I think those two terms are important. And so I, I, I guess what I try to grasp is how consciousness can be digitized. And and I have I have I see no evidence that this can be done. Um I can see how we can digitize an a logarithm, I can see how we, we can uh, digitize thought patterns, but I don't see how we can digitize consciousness. So that's, that's one of the problems I have. Of course, we don't have a definition for consciousness, well, okay. so it's hard to discuss it. Um, yeah, I, I accept that, but I mean, built into the presentation, Rich, is, is assumptions, and I think one of the assumptions is that you can digitize consciousness, and I don't see any evidence of that. <laughs> well, no, I certainly wouldn't say there's well, I, uh, such an assumption. We, it's a big problem. We, it's undefined. You're kind of challenging me to do something which is undefined. Uh, but but if I was, I don't know, if I can try to be more accommodating and sympathetic, uh, I think it is we, we have many, many senses of things that make sense to us, but are not, are not I mean, we may be using nouns for them, like consciousness, but they're not actual specific things. Um, they are a pattern. Um, they, something like attention could be that attention is some critical part of the brain's operation, or it could be that attention is just a name we use for the fact that we have eyes, and our eyes can only be pointed in one direction at a time. And so we might be working really hard, oh, to get this thing called attention. But there really isn't a thing called attention. It just has to control your motors to, look, to gather information and do the optimal behavior. And so uh, it seems plausible to me that attention, although it seems like a thing, my, where is my attention focused? Might just be a name for a, a, a way of common way of interacting that people do. Not necessarily all animals might not work that way at all. Uh, and so I think it's probably similar to consciousness. I mean, the obvious meaning of consciousness is that the machine is on. You knock it out. You turn the switch off. It's not running. It's no longer conscious. Uh, it could just mean nothing more than that. So we, we are familiar in our normal lives. People can be conscious or not. They can be sleeping. They can be hit on the head. 
And so we developed this. This is a useful word, a useful distinction for us. Um, but it, it's, it's not necessarily a special thing. If you can do all the rest. I was also trained as a psychologist. Early, I was also trained as a psychologist. One thing we always tried to do is, is when we operationalize everything. And so we could try to operationalize consciousness. Um, you know, how can you tell the difference between something conscious or not conscious? Yeah, it's really. Uh, it's just a very undefined thing. <laughs> we can talk and, and think and try to form the right actions, including speech actions. If someone could make all the right actions but wasn't conscious, would that make any sense? <laughs> Sorry. So any are, other questions? Are there other? I got one comment. One comment to finish off the, uh, <laughs> the course. Um, so I think just uh, just. Uh, uh, Earl's point, um, it got me thinking about, uh, I guess I'm coming out in defense of the presentation here, but I think maybe that a lot of what we think about what is deemed as conscious thought and conscious processes, um, I think when, once you put them up under close examination, they don't really seem as, as special or as conscious as, as they once were. So I remember um, Jonathan Schaefer brought up this term about AI and how there's like this shifting target and, and like you know, uh, years ago, if you said that we have a program that can do spell check, you'd say, oh man, that's amazing. And now it's kind of, oh no, it's just a mechanical process. It's, it's not really AI. AI is something more special. Um, and so you, there's this kind of constant shift and AI gets whittled away at. But I think the same thing could be said for, for human consciousness and that um, if you keep studying things more and more, you find out that, oh, there actually isn't a lot of thought going into this. And uh, there's this one study I remember that's I think it's pretty controversial but there was, it, it had to do with um, with uh, conscious making a conscious effort to move your finger at a certain time and uh, a lot of what they found out I think was that um, the sort of the neural activity um, uh, that generates the movement sort of precedes the conscious perception of that uh, so the movement so your decision is sort of in a sense already made before you even make that movement so the choice is like already made for you um, but that's something that we really consider to be conscious thought uh, so I guess the same thing could be could be said for attention I know like the superior colliculus that's that's huge for attention uh, and orienting to something um, but it's but it's mostly uh, unconscious um, but yeah that, that's that's my two cents I guess so, uh, Rich, you, a few moments ago, you, you talked about sleep. It, it, does sleep have a future? Will uh, digital brains, uh, you know, uploaded to a non-biological substrate? I think sleep substrate? is still very much a mystery, scientifically, why we do it. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's some hypotheses. It, it, it seems, I, I mean, it's, it's related to many things having to do with health, with, uh, you know, obesity, with uh, uh, hypertension. Man, many uh, of, of, of the big uh, uh, health problems that we have are, are also directly to, related to sleep. But when you get out of the realm of... Uh, Biology, I, I suppose during sleep we're kind of experimenting with ideas, healing. I, I don't know what all the things that are going on, but don't you imagine that there'll be a tremendous efficiency gained when uh, brains decide that they don't need to sleep anymore because they're no longer uh, biologically based? So won't, won't that make a tremendous difference? If, if we only need it for our biology and not for our computations, yeah. then you're, you're right. 
And I think that's quite possible. But it's also possible that it might have an important computational function. As you mentioned, experimenting right. in your sleep, we know that animals do do that. Yeah. Uh, but not with a high percentage of the time spent sleeping. Yes. Um, yeah. I was reading recently uh, the theory that, uh, they, that sleep is needed so that your brain becomes bathed with cerebrospinal fluid and it kind of clears, cleans things up, like prevents the things that lead to Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Yeah, but that, that's, that seems like a, a maintenance biological function. And if, that, if right. that's the case, then. And it, and it might, might be like, you know, the periodic backup and that sort of thing that, yeah. that's done. E even some uh, computer systems shut down just because their biological owners are asleep and they don't want people going in there trying to uh, hack the system. <laughs> Everybody's, everybody else is asleep. I don't know. You, you, you can argue it various ways. Um, how, how important is our current knowledge of AI to government policy decisions? Do, do we simply not know, know enough to, to recommend anything? I mean, or it, it, are there huge errors being made because, you know, government of, Officials are not taking these things into account. Where, where, where does the balance lay there? I hope the government won't screw it up too much. <laughs> that's that's a very I, careful answer. I wouldn't look answer. for them to help it. Yeah, I don't. I don't want it to be. You know, the nightmare is it. It's funded by defense departments. Yeah. And that's the way the singularity comes to us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, or the NSA, or yeah. So I would like to keep the governments away from it. Hopefully, uh, I have good hope that governments will be collapsing before too long, <laughs> and they'll be doing less damage. That's I my see. Hope. Okay. Well, that's that's an interesting way to look at it. Okay. Well, any other burning questions before we get back to the music? Uh, no. Okay. Well, let let. Thank you very very much, Thanks, Rick. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.